Hello, everybody. Welcome to the third session of this symposium, which is uh, dedicated to development. So we have three speakers, like in the other sessions. And uh, like in the other sessions, we will take questions at the end of the three presentations. So after, um, I'm delighted to welcome our first speaker, um, Rene Mayer. He's Associate Professor of, of, uh, of Molecular Medicine at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. And his uh, research interests are in uh, thymic organogenesis and studying the potential of pluripotent stem cells to recapitulate the developmental steps involved in thymic um, organogenesis. Okay. So if you're ready, Renee, you can start screen sharing. Yeah. So thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'd like to um, talk about deconstruction, uh, deconstructing thymus development to reconstruct immune education from human pluripotent stem cells. And I'd like to start out um, by um, telling you that uh, thymic stroma dysfunction is um, involved in different uh, function, um, dysfunctions of the immune system and uh, functional decline. And why I'm here is um, probably that in 22Q11 microdeletion, uh, patients uh, also can be affected by thymic hypo and aplasia, which leads to T cell de uh, deficiency. But there are also other syndromes and specific um, transcription factor deletions that can uh, lead to defects in thymus organogenesis. Um, so for complete DeGeorge syndrome, recently FDA approved uh, thymus transplantation as a therapy. Um, so that's, that's very exciting uh, for the field. And um, I'd like to share with you a, a view of a developmental immunologist um, on, on uh, how these diseases happen or when they happen is actually very important. So a lot of them happen during the uh, during early stages of thymus uh, development or thymus specification. So obviously to study them, there's a problem uh, that we don't have access uh, to these uh, cell populations. By the time the um, syndrome is diagnosed, the cells uh, are either absent or have, uh, have changed. Um, so there, there are no pre-disease uh, cell types uh, available. Um, obviously, there's limited uh, patient-specific tissue for cell culture models to study uh, mechanisms. And um, even those cell culture models would not be very genetically tractable with uh, primary tissue. Um, and further, transplantation um, approaches are inherently limited, uh, have inherent limitations due to non-autologous tissue uh, for the transplantation. Animal models have told us a great deal, and we heard a lot of it uh, over the past couple of hours. Um, but these uh, knockout mice are um, often not fully recapitulating allelic variants, and uh, inbred models often don't capture the the whole heterogeneous patient population. So complementary systems are needed for faster and mecha um, mechanistic and treatment discovery. So I, uh, I'm really following nicely uh, Ralda, who already explained uh, the importance of pluripotent stem cells and how we utilize them. So they can easily be derived from uh, skin biopsies. If we then understand how to differentiate them into the patient relevant cell types, we can then further move on to preclinical models, either in vitro or in humanized systems, or eventually um, aim for transplantation uh, therapy for cell replacement therapies. Um, but the bottleneck for uh, thymus uh, affected diseases, uh, where the thymic epithelium is really a, a key um, player in the education of the developing uh, T cells is uh, that we don't really have um, good differentiation protocols uh, at the moment. So currently available differentiation uh, protocols allow us to generate uh, precursor that exhibit molecular inaccuracies. So the, uh, we entering the field, we felt that there is uh, room for improvement. And this is what I'm going to talk um, to you about uh, how we engage this. 
Um, just to tell you a little bit, I think Casey already alluded to this, how we uh, go about differentiating cells. So we, we don't go from the pluripotent stem cell all the way to the cell type we want, either cortical thymic epithelial cells or medullary thymic epithelial cells with different functions in the thymus. We try to recapitulate stepwise differentiation approaches uh, where we looked at, uh, to the embryo for guidance, where pluripotent stem cells uh, first uh, di differentiate into the different germ layers. We're interested in definitive endoderm that we would like to pattern towards the anterior foregut endoderm, which then can be further patterned to pharyngeal foregut endoderm. And the thymic epithelium develops from the ventral, ventral aspect of the third pouch. Um, and the dorsal part gives rise to the uh, parathyroid. In the dish, obviously, we don't have these structural changes, so we take advantage of specific combinations of transcription factors that are expressed as surface molecules to identify at each individual step on the differentiation product. Um, so when we started looking at this, uh, we, we felt that the thymic epithelial cell lineage, uh, although understood at uh, main differentiation intermediates, uh, was far from what has been achieved for the hematopoietic system, where over the past 20 uh, years or so, we really got a better understanding of all the intermediate populations, all the way to almost a, a, a flux towards the different cell uh, fates. And this was largely achieved uh, more recently with single cell transcriptomics. And Bernice already nicely introduced the concept of uh, single cell RNA-seq and uh, um, regulation of, of uh, gene control. So a couple of years then ago, we uh, aimed to understand thymus development on single cell transcriptomic level, just to give a transcriptional framework uh, for the thymus organogenesis, which we would like to recapitulate. Um, so we thought that if we profile the whole thymus, we will understand all the players in, in this different uh, differentiation process, which allows us then to uh, speculate about how the maturation of the thymic epithelium is achieved and how these different cell intermediates talk to each other. So in our uh, atlas, we found mesenchyme, endothelium, epithelium, and blood cells, and we resolved the heterogeneity of these uh, subpopulations further. But at the same time, we realized we kind of um, um, were too advanced with what we were uh, looking at because the current protocols in the um, pluripotent stem cell differentiation was really, they were really aiming uh, at that point uh, or currently at uh, making precursor cells to the thymic epithelium that then uh, enters um, this equivalent time period of maturation. So more recently then we tried to uh, remedy that fact and go a little earlier. So we uh, started profiling on transcriptomic level um, embryonic days 9.5 to 12.5. So this is the, um, the time period where the anterior foregut and mainly the pharynx then are patterned. And uh, we were um, pleased to see that machine learning approaches then sorted out different organ domain specific epithelia um, that we could uh, further identify as, as uh, thymic epithelium, specifically subsets, cortical and medullary thymic epithelium, um, parathyroid, um, ultimo branchial um, bodies, and, and so forth. Um, so we obviously wanted to know whether key marker genes that we know from the literature uh, distributed accordingly, and we uh, could confirm that, for example, FOXM1 really is, uh, is found in the thymic epithelial cell um, area. So then we went on to uh, validate on, on spatial level at E12.5 a couple of the known transcripts as well as the uh, novel transcripts we, we found uh, just to validate this uh, transcriptomic uh, framework that, that we now achieved uh, for, for the um, pharyngeal endoderm patterning. We also noted that most of the organ domains seem to um, separate themselves at 11.5 and 12.5. So we also moved on to uh, profile those two uh, stages with single cell ATAC. The difference to a single cell transcriptomic analysis is that we don't, um, we not only find specific loci that are activated, but we also find um, in the non-coding space uh, putative cis regulatory elements that uh, can be involved in the control of these, um, of these genes. So in these cis regulatory elements, you can then also look 
whether you find specific transcription factor motifs and predict which transcription factors might be responsible for, um, for driving gene regulation in those uh, subsets. So here, for example, is an IL-7 locus, which is thymus-specific, and it's uh, specific, um, there is a putative cis regular T element, which is specifically engaged in the thymic epithelial cell uh, clusters, whereas um, MAF-B, which is specific to the um, parathyroid, is specifically engaged in, in the parathyroid uh, cluster. So we, we then can also match, and as expected, uh, transcription factor gene activity such as SOX2 really was accompanied with uh, emergence of SOX2 um, motifs in, in these um, regulatory elements. So what we really were excited then about is to find out how this all comes together to regulate the gene regulatory networks that are uh, cell type specific. And we uh, looked to a, a tool that was um, developed by the Morris Lab called Cell Oracle, which then allows you through integration of ATAC-seq and single cell RNA-seq to have um, cell type specific uh, gene regulatory networks. So here are some gene regulatory networks that we identified, for example, the thymus specific gene regulatory network and the parathyroid uh, gene regulatory network. So you now can identify some of the known factors such as FOXM1 that are key in the uh, in um, thymus development, but you can also start seeing other factors that previously were, were not so apparent that they play a role in, um, in organogenesis at this time point. You can then also follow up specific factors uh, again, FOXM1 is an example here and ask where is this gene according to the network, um, where, where is this factor um, probably active and identify the target networks, in this case, the CTAX and the MTAX. For GCM2, it's a parathyroid, for PAX9, it's the thyroid region. So, um, you know, we were um, pretty uh, excited about this. Um, but um, one feature of the tool was uh, really uh, cool, we thought, which is that you can simulate um, um, perturbations. So um, we simulated a FOXM1 knockout, which our model would predict that the most mature thymic epithelial cells uh, are kind of uh, not reverted, but that we do not get them, but they, they, we kind of get a developmental block possibly here to test the simulation, whether this is really something that uh, we would find. Uh, we took advantage of the FOXN1 uh, knockout mouse and a thymic newt mouse, and this is exactly what we observed. So the knockout um, cells kind of stop here and do not reach uh, the, the thymic region, the more advanced ma uh, mature thymic epithelium. Uh, classifier then um, um, validated that uh, these different uh, cell types really are CTACs, MTACs, as well as uh, thymic progenitors. And we found a, um, a depletion in the, in the CTACs that was uh, significant. So now you can simulate uh, a knockout before even looking at the actual uh, knockout mouse in this case. And we found a um, fairly good correlation between the, um, the expression that we simulate or the, the model prediction for the, um, for the knockout uh, compared to the expression that we actually observed. And many of the literature uh, markers that, were, um, that we picked from the literature uh, changed uh, for, for the thymic epithelial knockout. Uh, we could validate some earlier um, changes in gene expression of markers that were, um, were found in the literature. Uh, as well as some of the novel uh, markers that we found in the, in the text and the uh, thymic epithelium in our transcriptomic atlas. So um, just to summarize this part, um, so human pluripotent stem cells really provide us an opportunity, as we heard before today, to model disease. And in the long run, we might even think about autologous cell replacement therapy. Um, we want, want to recapitulate uh, normal development in the dish to, uh, for faithful differentiation of the cellular product. Um, the current uh, tech um, differentiation protocols uh, have molecular accuracy, uh, inaccuracies at the moment that we, we would like to fix based on benchmarking our differentiation with some of the 
um, some of the resources we generate in the um, transcriptomic space. Um, so single cell omic resources um, provide this framework to inform pharyngeal endoderm differentiation. And the gene regulatory networks can really be a starting point to predict key drivers or see how, how uh, things we identify maybe in patient populations might be involved in the pharyngeal endoderm um, development. Um, so let me then uh, move on to the second part of the talk where I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we use now these, um, these frameworks to inform our um, pluripotent stem cell differentiation approaches. Uh, first, we integrated our in-house resource with previously published data to really cover now from the pluripotent state at E3.5 uh, in the mouse, so the inner cell mass, all the way to thymic um, organogenesis, which is 12.5, so we basically have every day now cells sampled, uh, which makes up about uh, um, 75,000 cells. Um, the annotation looks a little messy, but let me point out some edges that matter. So the uh, epiblast is down here and the inner cell mass. The thymus segregates here, parathyroid is close by, so is the UVB. And we have intestine uh, over here. So um, we kind of spread out these different cell types uh, now in this UMAP embedding. And we quickly validate some of the markers. So you can now look at this, um, at this um, atlas, so to speak, for the different markers that you are interested in and um, can pick some that can inform the differentiation approaches. So FOXM1, for example, is very specific um, to the thymic epithelium, GCM2 for the parathyroid, but uh, also the literature suggests other markers such as APCAM or keratin-8, and you can benchmark these uh, markers that you may wanna or may not wanna choose uh, to inform whether your differentiation was, was a success. Um, in the meantime, we also um, advanced our efforts in generating these thymic epithelial cells from human pluripotent stem cells. Reiteratively, we uh, optimized every differentiation step with small molecules and growth factors. And uh, we were pleased to see that uh, we, at some point we generated PEX9 protein expression, expressing cells that also express FOXN1 and APCAM not uh, displayed here. And over differentiation time, these cell cultures also started having uh, interleukin-7 uh, present, which is uh, a factor that it would interact with the, with the uh, lymphocytes. Uh, we were further able to then uh, move uh, this um, um, basically 2D monolayer culture into 3D. So this is how it looks like. And we were happy to see that uh, now for the first time, we saw protein levels of HLA-DR expression in at least a subset of, of these um, uh, FOXN1 positive cells. Uh, the FOXN1 GFP is a, is a knock-in reporter cell line or, uh, that we generated um, to measure uh, the endogenous uh, FOXN1 locus activity. So let's uh, go back to our single cell tools. If we then analyze such a comparison in uh, an experiment where we look at the organoid and we compare it to the, our monolayer cultures uh, with different, um, different treatments, we can see that um, we have consistent with the uh, protein expression, HLI, uh, DR expression specifically in the organoid. Um, culture system, uh, we have increased PSMB11 expression FOXN1, uh, CCL25. Uh, if we then look, uh, resolve this into single cells, you can uh, look over here and you see um, that there's a corner that is specifically uh, high in FOXN1. This corner is specifically on uh, the organoid culture system and that's where HLA uh, class two is expressed. Um, FOXA2 is downregulated, um, which is expected as it's a more immature marker. And uh, just for comparison, I also put APCAM and keratin-8 here, um, which is less specific. And um, so we, we believe some of the other markers are a better, um, better measurement to, to uh, analyze your stem cell cultures. Uh, one surprise that we would have uh, missed otherwise is that we also found cells that expressed GCM2 as well as GATA3. 
So those could be ind indicative of parathyroid developing. Remember, I told you the parathyroid is developing also in the third pouch region, although in the light in the uh, vent in the dorsal region. So maybe it's not all that surprising to find a mixture of these cells in the dish. Um, so we are still trying to sort this out, how, how to coax uh, towards either one of these different differentiation conditions. Um, then going back, taking advantage of our machine learning computational tools. Um, in the lab, we developed a correlation-based classifier called CellMatch. So now you can take the mouse reference and cross-species, cross-platform, ask um, where do the human ES cells classify? And uh, we were pleased to see that it's the um, cluster for the uh, ICM, which is the inner cell mass, uh, the pluripotent equivalent in the, in the mouse. Um, but for example, the monolayer uh, culture would uh, cluster more towards the uh, esophagus uh, or pharynx, but uh, the 3D culture would uh, highlight the um, the thymic epithelia precursors, uh, progenitors, I should say, which is uh, very exciting. So we think we are, we are on the right uh, route here. So just to summarize this, so the directed differentiation of uh, human pluripotent stem cells in vitro can uh, generate tech pre um, precursors, and we, we detect important uh, tech markers on RNA and protein level, which we think is critical for those transcription factors, obviously, to work. Uh, the 3D culture, which is novel, is um, allowing us to further mature the, uh, the tech-like cells uh, in vitro. And uh, we now try to benchmark, rather than picking a few handful markers, we try to benchmark our differentiation cultures with computational tools in high dimensional space. And uh, we hope that in the future we can overcome current shortcomings um, in the differentiation inaccuracies and generate a stem cell product with higher uh, fidelity. So I should really thank the people who uh, do all the work in the lab, the bioinformaticians and wet lab biologists. Uh, our collaborators wouldn't be possible without them and uh, our funding agencies. And thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to share some of our work here. Thank you, Renee, for a beautiful presentation.